beautiful day in Ottawa and an even better day at Carleton. So welcome. A few days ago, I was uh, looking in the library at uh, books on universities. And one of the books was entitled um, The University, a Medieval Institution. And the uh, back jacket of it um, gave the thesis that universities haven't changed since the Middle Ages and uh, that that's one of the problems that we have. And I started thinking about it and I remembered Northrop Fry, who was uh, uh, principal of uh, Victoria College um, and who I followed. And Northrop Fry said to me one day, you know, dear, the greatest force in the universe is inertia. And um, I said, really? And he, he said, yes, and I'm particularly referring to the campus. And I, I thought that was really kind of interesting. And later on, I was reading Newton. And um, Newton says that inertia is a force even greater than gravity. And I thought, well, this is really pretty serious. And then I thought to myself, oh my goodness, Northrop Fry was wrong. The university is not about inertia. The university is about change. Um, the universities began and grew in times of change. When you see great social changes, um, revolutions, education became available to people. That's what happened in the French Revolution. One of the results of the French Revolution was public education for people in France. Um, when you think about it, when there were great economic revolutions, more people could go to university. Um, when there were um, times of change, universities came about and universities grew. And the same happened with Carleton. We started out in a time of change when all of the soldiers came back from the war. So universities are agents of change, they're about change, and they're created by change. And we're living right now in a time of change. Um, we are buffeted by winds of change. One of the winds of change is the, the change from societal responsibility to individual responsibility. We see it right across North America when um, instead of having the society say we are responsible for university education, we're putting that responsibility off on the shoulders of the individual. And when we do that, we forget what Michelet said was that each individual is humanity. And you can go to Napoleon who said, it's not persuading one or two people that's going to change the world, it's persuading the masses. And so when we put responsibility on the individual for society, instead of remembering that society has a responsibility as well for the individual, we're affecting a change that can be really serious. And we, we as a university must remember the importance of the individual and of the support for the individual. And that's why in the strategic plan, we talk about access and student support. We also see in the society today uh, a movement where we are going from pure research being supported heavily to applied research. And we, have, we forget that there is no applied research if there isn't pure research. Pure research always pre precedes the application. And if at Carleton University we are strong in solving the world's problems, in doing applied research, it's because we have very strong pure research as well. And one can't forget that partnership. Also, we see a shift from human concerns to technological concerns. Um, we want to support the machines. We think we maybe could um, solve all the problems of society and save money by doing things via machines. And we forget that machines are used by people. Machines are made by people. And with, if they don't suit people, the machines won't be around for very long. And that's why I also think that in our strategic plan, we have to look at that interface between human beings and technology. And that happens in the digital technology field. So when you see all of those changes that we're living in, we also see a changed expectation of universities. There, are, there was a time when people thought that going to university was where you went to get a great education, to be a better person. Um, Montesquieu 
sorry, Montaigne, I go back a century here. Um, I see John Osborne looking at me, and I knew he knew that right away. I gotta get it right. So Montaigne, um, he was sent by his parents to university in Latin, because universities all ran in Latin in those days, and you got an education in Latin, and it had no practical purpose. It didn't help you run the castle or the chateau any better. It just made you a better person. Sometimes we forget about that, and in days when there are economic hardships, um, society tends to forget that education is something wonderful, and it's not just there to solve society's problems, um, to help the homeless and, and to cure cancer and to create civil society and to protect the civil good and um, to create a civic um, discourse and a, a concern for governance. Um, they forget that university is also about discovery of knowledge. Um, it's about creating cultured individuals and a culture where individuals are important. And what is important about those individuals is the knowledge that they have and the fact that the knowledge that they have turns into wisdom. And some people have said universities are knowledge factories, and that's not true. Universities are places where wisdom is acquired, earned. And wisdom is earned. It's earned because of experience. It's knowledge that's tested but it's also knowledge that is ethical and ha has moral value. And we forget that universities have that as a purpose. So in these economically hard times, um, I think that we're sitting in a really nice place. Um, you know, we talked about location as being great in the, in the strategic plan, but we are in a nice place, and I am really proud to be here. I'm proud of Carleton, I'm proud of our students, my goodness, every day they surprise me by doing greater and more wonderful things, winning Rhodes Scholarships, doing tremendous things. Faculty, um, I got almost all the books, not all, um, out, of, uh, out of the library and from Amazon um, and all the other places that you can order. I don't want to advertise anyone. Um, <laughs> all the places that you can order on the internet, I got faculty books that have been written by faculty at Carleton. And I figure that it's going to take me several years to get through all of them, and I read really quickly. This is a place where there's an impressive amount of scholarship going on. And not only that, you're doing it every day, so the, every time I finish one, a new one appears. This is a really impressive place. And not only is it impressive because of what you do in terms of scholarship and discovery, but it's also impressive because of the community that you are. You are a community that really does care. And I've told people that the, the student that won the Rhodes Scholarship, um, Alicia, um, when she got on the shortlist, I called her up. And I had talked to Alicia before she got on the shortlist, and when I was writing the, the letter of recommendation. And Alicia was, seemed to me to be a little bit shy and because I said to her, Alicia, you know, are, do you have good grades? And she said, well, yeah, sort of. I mean, I, like, I got A's. And I said, well, no, that's, that's good, okay. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Alicia, if you want to get a Rhodes Scholarship, you also have to do some sports. Do you do any sports? Well, she said, I, I'm on the Canadian Olympic team for the um, cross-country skiing. Do you think that would be okay? I said, oh, no, I think that's okay. And I said, well, you know, Alicia, but you also have to volunteer for society. You have to show that you care, that you're part of the world. And she said, well, last year I organized this conference and I raised $150,000 for it. And I brought together 80 students and we had 40 mentors, including three former prime ministers, come and work with us on the environment. Oh, I said, I think you've got it. Um, but I, I, I thought, I've got to tell Alicia before she goes into that interview, that she shouldn't hide her light under a basket. She should say, I'm Alicia, and I did some great things, because I know that the students from some of the other universities are going to boast about themselves. And when I talked to her on the phone, I said, Alicia, I'll practice with you the interview. And she said to me, no, no, that's OK. You don't have to do that. And I said, oh, no, no, I'd like to. She said, but I already had practice with five faculty members. Carter Elwood and all the members of the committee have practiced with me already. She went out and won the Rhodes Scholarship. And when she did, I got a phone call from the, or an email actually, from 
the different faculty members on the committee, and every one of them said, isn't it wonderful, a Carleton student one, isn't Alicia wonderful? Not one of them said, we, we spent time with her. Not one of them said, we helped her interview. That's the kind of community that we have, a community that really cares and works together. So I'm proud to be here. And I'm excited by the Economic Times. I you know some of you might say that's a little odd. Um, how could you be excited by the Economic Times? Well, I think it's a time of challenge when good people are going to succeed. And Carlton is not only good, it's great, and we are going to succeed. It means that we have to be a little bit more creative, a little more innovative, but we are innovative and creative, and we've always been that way. It means that we can't just look at the local world. We have to look around us and pretend and be international, make the international community be our playground. Um, we have to think of new kinds of diplomas and programs, and I see that happening every day in the faculty. So I know this is a place where we can meet the economic challenges. And there are some schools that are out there figuring out, and, um, and, and Faraday gave me an article the other day about business schools in some areas of the country are figuring out that they're gonna get more students because they won't be able to find jobs. That's not the kind of place that Carlton is. Carlton's the kind of place where students are going to come to study every single subject because it is so good and so exciting that no matter how hard the times are, they're going to invest in themselves and their education at a really good place. So um, what do we do to get a strategic plan? <clears throat> First of all, I should tell you that <clears throat> a woman's work is never done. I'm sure you've heard that. It goes for men, too. We won't, we won't be sexist about this. Um, a plan is never finished. So we've got a document, but that doesn't mean that we're going to roll over and say that's it for the next five years. Every day we're going to add to it. Every day we're going to test ourselves. And if we didn't do something right, if we picked something that wasn't working, we'll adjust it. We'll change. When new opportunities come, we'll be ready. Because in our plan, it says we're going to be innovative, and we will be. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, how did we get here? How did, how did this plan happen? Well, it didn't just happen. It was not sort of self-generation. Um, the plan happened because for the last two years, you have all been planning. When I got here, I read tons of plans for departments, units, um, institutes, uh, faculties, and for the university as a whole, and really, what it seemed like was my job was to put them together. And when I read them all, I thought, how can I put them together? How can I make it be that we are Carlton? And everybody says, yes. So I thought, well, since I, I read all of this, let me talk to the people. So I listened to students and faculty and alumni and the arts community, the business community, parents, teachers in schools. Um, we had all kinds of focus groups and round tables. I visited with very various departments and faculties. And when we got all the way through all of that, I said, it seems to me that there are some identifying pillars. Because the first thing that you have to do when you want a strategic plan for a whole university is to say, why is Carleton special? Why would somebody come to Carleton and no other university? Why would somebody give us $100 million that they would have given to somebody else, but they want to give it to Carlton. Why would the government invest in us? What do we have that's special? Well, when I read all the plans, the first thing that hit me was everybody said, located in Canada's capital, we're Canada's capital university, well, we've got to make something of it. Our location is gorgeous. I've often told people that the first day I was here on the 1st of July, I went downtown and I was watching the fireworks and um, I met a young lady on the street corner. It was kind of dark, so she didn't really realize how old I am. And so she said to me, are you in, new in Ottawa? And I said, yes, this is the first time I get to see the fireworks in Ottawa. I've always seen them on TV. And she said to me, oh, that's really nice. Where are you? And I said, well, I'm at Carlton. And she said, oh, that's really nice. I'm at Ottawa. You're so lucky to be at Carlton. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. I said, well, how do you know this if you're at Ottawa? She said, well, you know, I'm the president of the student body at the University of Ottawa, and I am just so jealous of you at Carleton because you've got this gorgeous location. You're in between the canal and the river, and it's beautiful, and you can have a community. 
and you are still close to downtown, but you are among yourselves. And you can tell when you go to Carlton, people know each other and there's something special that's different from Ottawa where we go out of class and psh, we're gone in the market and who knows who we are and where we are. Well, that was pretty good. And I said to her, would you like to come to Carlton? <laughs> 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 and, and so she might sign up for graduate work. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> we know that we've got a special location, but we've got to play on that location, and we can't make it so that somebody could come here from Calgary and study history or, or languages for four years and never leave the campus. They probably could, but we don't want that to happen. We want them to be part of what's wonderful about Ottawa. It's not just our location, but it is a great resource with all of the international um, embassies, with all of the national agencies, all the NGOs that are here, the wonderful galleries and museums. Ottawa offers us so much, and we have to really take advantage of it. And so we've set up a committee, and I've asked uh, Catherine Graham to chair that committee. Um, and the committee is a committee dedicated to community engagement, to make the most of being in Ottawa. How can we go out to the museums of science, to the, every, every agency, the uh, atomic energy, to the, the Museum of Civilization, and see what it is that we can do that knits ourselves to that community and makes us both a vital and vibrant part of the community, but the community part of us. See, our gallery is there. We're already there in the gallery. So exciting times for that. Um, we, uh, I also noted that we were innovative because um, first of all, um, when I, I asked faculty what we did that was different here, they all said, oh, we do interdisciplinary programs. In fact, they said, we invented the word interdisciplinary. Well, actually, I checked it in the dictionary. The word existed before, but it probably never was used. So, <laughs> so Carlton goes there. Um, and we have lots of interdisciplinary programs. We've got an interesting faculty structure and institutes that don't exist at other schools. We have the ability to create new programs, and I see them coming up every day. So let's keep that uh, innovation and keep it going. Um, the next thing, we, when I look at the research that's there, there is the pure research. We are doing neutrinos. 30,000 of them have passed by my body since I started talking. I learned that in one of the documents. Um, but anyway, um, besides looking at neutrinos, we're looking at solving the real world problems, what is going on in the world, and that is a real asset. And I think it's a reason that the community will support us. And then um, we also have, let's see, what did I say? Innovation, location, solving real world problems. And what was the fourth pillar? Does anybody remember? John, he's just smiling at me. I know he knows. <laughs> he doesn't know. OK. So anyway, we've got these four pillars in our, in our, um, uh, in our oh, the fourth pillar was community. And I already talked about community because we are one community together. And so those are the four identifiers of the university. And we picked those four identifiers and said, this is what makes Carleton special. This is why people would come to Carleton. And then because we are interdisciplinary, because we are innovative, we have to continue being that way. When I talked to parents and students in their focus groups, I gave them each a question at the end of the focus group. I actually gave the same question to everybody, but the parents and the students were quite memorable because I said to them, if somebody gave me $10 million and you were me, you're the university president, so you just got a gift of $10 million and you could invest it in the Carleton University, what would you do with it? So there's this long silence. And both the parents and the students said, you know, we know you expect us to say, give more money for scholarships and bursaries. But we're not going to say that. We're going to say, give more money to the faculty so they can do more innovative programs. Innovative programs are the mark of this institution. People come here because of the exciting programs. Keep developing them. Keep making the future happen. Be the university of the future. I thought that was pretty powerful, pretty selfless, too. So let's all invest in that, in that innovation. And how can we invest in the innovation? Well, it's hard times. We can't start from scratch. Because if, if, it, if it's not hard times, we can go out and buy new ingredients. But we can't do that. We have to take what's, what's at hand. 
and what do we have here? So I, I started looking at what are the programs that we have on the campus <clears throat> that are really exceptional, that really respond to social needs, that really respond to the idea that government might support us. And among those programs, I found sustainability in the environment, health, um, found uh, digital um, media, new digital media, and we found global identities and globalization. And I didn't find them by myself. Uh, faculty um, suggested them. Everybody came and put that together. And so we got these four areas of what we would do um, as new areas uh, of interest. But they're not really new areas of interest because there are hundreds of people working in those areas on campus. What we're going to do is bring those people together and through that, the fact that they are working together, we will create something new. And I think that ends up being one of the key words of this whole report and it's collaboration. If we all work with each other, if we work with other institutions, if we work with our community, if we reach out to the world, that collaboration is going to make Carleton really great and a really special place. So we have these four areas and then we say, well, if you have a strategic plan, it also has to be about being better. And yesterday, one of the really smart students from the Charlottetown called me up and said, you said Carlton is like a utopia, and the strategic plan is about getting better. Utopia is perfect. How can you make the perfect better? And I said, that's really good. But I didn't say Carlton was utopia. I said, we're like a utopia. That's a simile. <laughs> um, not quite, we're not quite there. Um, maybe in a couple years. So let's work towards that utopia, towards perfection. And so <clears throat> how do we get to perfection? Well, who knows what perfection is? Let's just start with something that we can measure. Take the G13, the top 13 universities in the country, and let's look at what they have compared to what we have, OK? Well, you know, they proportionately, the student numbers, student faculty numbers, not so bad. Um, faculty salaries, number of, number of full-time, part-time. You know, what are the differences? Where, do we, where are we different from these other institutions? Just to give ourselves a measure of where we could go if we wanted, if we consider that some people think they're good, maybe we want to get a little bit better ourselves. What do we have to do? Well, we looked at it and said, well, you know, our retention rate has to, has to improve a little bit. Um, and when we talk about improving re retention rate, I'm not talking about the grades people get in class. That's just one measure. What I'm talking about is a culture of success. Um, when we take students at Carleton University, the entry, entry average is 80%. Students with an 80% average should be able to go to university and graduate, and we want them to. And if they're not graduating, let's figure out why they aren't graduating. Maybe we need more residences. Maybe we need more study space. Maybe we need more scholarships. Um, maybe we need better advising. Who knows what it is that we need? We need to have some committees that look at it, that analyze it, that figure out how we can serve our students better. And I should say that we've been doing this. Um, people, this isn't a brand new idea. Pete Carlton has been getting better every year. And so we're now at the, the average for Ontario. But as I said to the vice presidents, I don't want to go around and say, my goal is to be average. Um, we want to be above average. So let's just ramp it up a little bit. Um, we also looked at uh, all of the things that we could do to make ourselves into a better institution. And we made a, a little list of some of those, those and gave ourselves some deadlines and timelines as to how that would happen. When that was done, I put this on the internet and asked everybody for comments. We got about 300 comments um, over the holiday break. Um, I answered every one of them. Um, most of them have been included because they were wonderful comments. And the plan is now um, probably looks a little more like, you know, remember the story of what, what is a, a horse designed by a committee is really a camel? Well, this is the camel version. Um, it looks a little more like a camel, but it's lumpy. But you know, in those lumps, you carry more water and you can go further. So I think that this plan is stronger because of what everybody has added to the plan. And I thank you for that. What's going to happen now? Um, now that we have this plan, it's going to devolve and we're going to have an academic plan that fits with it, a research plan, a fiscal plan, a communications plan. 
and a fundraising plan and a master plan because we need to have our facilities have to be such that what we want to become, the facilities allow that to happen. So I've talked a long time and I started off with North, Northrop Fry and I guess I should end with Northrop Fry, you know, a little symmetry, not fearful symmetry, that's Blake. Symmetry will be Northrop Fry. And um, when I got to Victoria, Northrop Fry was uh, quite an elderly gentleman. And you know, he was kind of a living myth, a living legend. And he'd sit in the corner easy chair, that was like his chair, nobody dared sit there, in the um, uh, faculty lounge. And he would put the newspaper up like this around his face. And every now and then you'd hear a <laughs> and the pages would turn. And then there were faculty sitting over at the sofa, uh, on the sofa and they were doing a crossword puzzle on the table and I'm sitting over in the corner on a straight back chair because I'm the young person there and I'm trying to correct my essays. But I'm listening, right? Because I might learn from these, you know, especially the, the vibes for coming off Northrop Fry. So the faculty at the table say, Nori, do you know a four letter word for bitter vetch? And there's silence. And then the paper kind of rustles, and he pulls it down, and he says, I don't know any four-letter words. <laughs> hmm. Well, I was reminded of that um, at the installation of the President of the United States, because he sure does know a four-letter word, and that four-letter word is hope. And I thought to myself, it's really interesting how he branded himself with that word and how it responded to the American people. But my next thought was, he didn't invent that word. That word was invented by educators, and it was a word that we all share every day in the university, and it's the word that we have at Carleton for the future, and the plan, to me, um, spells hope for our future. And I believe it's much more than hope, because it will become true because of all of you. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have each of the vice presidents say a few words. We have, um, first will be Faridin, and then we're going to have Kim, and Duncan, and George. <laughs>